In this lesson, we will examine two concepts related to standard deviation. The first concept is variance. Now, variance is closely related to standard deviation. In fact, when we calculate the standard deviation of a set of numbers, the variance of that set is equal to the value inside the square root here. So since the variance is equal to the number that we take the square root of in order to determine the standard deviation, we can say that the variance of a set of numbers is equal to the standard deviation of that set of numbers squared. So for example, if a set of numbers has a standard deviation of 3, then the variance of that set will be 3 squared, which is 9. And that's pretty much all you need to know about variance. The next concept to discuss is units of standard deviation. A unit of standard deviation is the same as the standard deviation of a set. So if the standard deviation of a set of numbers is k, then k equals 1 unit of standard deviation. Now questions involving standard deviation typically look something like this. Here we have a set of numbers, and we want to determine how many numbers in that set are within one unit of standard deviation from the mean. So since the standard deviation of set A is 4.4, then 4.4 equals one unit of standard deviation. Now here's how we handle all questions like this. First draw the number line and place the mean near the middle. Now mark a spot one unit of standard deviation to the right of the mean. Since this point is 4.4 units to the right of 12, the point is at 16.4. So we can say that 16.4 is one unit of standard deviation above the mean. Similarly, if we move another 4.4 units to the right, we can see that 20.8 is two units of standard deviation above the mean. Now if we move 4.4 units to the left of the mean, we get 7.6, and we can say that 7.6 is one unit of standard deviation below the mean. Similarly, if we move another 4.4 units to the left, we can see that 3.2 is two units of standard deviation below the mean. Now the question asks us to determine which numbers in the set are within one unit of standard deviation from the mean. So we are looking for numbers in this range, from one unit of standard deviation below the mean to one unit of standard deviation above the mean. In other words, we need to determine how many numbers in the set are between 7.6 and 16.4. Well, as we can see here, there are six numbers between 7.6 and 16.4. Okay, let's summarize. In this lesson, we learned how to calculate the variance of a set of numbers, and we learned about units of standard deviation. In this lesson, we'll examine a way to visually represent distributions of data, and we'll examine a special kind of distribution called the normal distribution. To set this up, please consider the following example. Let's say that 50 people rated a certain movie on a scale from 1 to 5. Now, if we keep track of the number of votes that each rating gets, we might get an outcome where 3 people give the movie a rating of 1, 5 people give it a 2, and so on. Now, although this frequency table provides the results of the survey, we might better understand the data if it were presented in the form of a bar chart. This chart is called a histogram, and it provides a convenient visual depiction of the distribution of data. Here we can immediately see that more people gave the movie a high rating than a low one. Now, another way to show the depiction of data is to calculate the relative frequencies. That is, the percent of the data that meets a certain criteria. So, for example, if 3 of the 50 people gave the movie a rating of 1, this is the same as saying that 6% of the people gave the movie a rating of 1. Likewise, if 5 out of 50 people gave the movie a rating of 2, the relative frequency here is 10%. And so on. Now, as you can see, the frequencies and the relative frequencies are very closely related. In fact, if we examine the histogram for the relative frequencies, we see that it's identical to the histogram for the frequencies. All right, now let's take a look at another distribution. Let's say we work at a factory that produces cans of soda. Now, although the machines are built to pour 355 milliliters of soda per can, they're not always perfect for various reasons. As part of quality control, 500 cans are randomly selected and the volume of soda is measured. 
the results are shown here on a relative frequency histogram. As you can see, the most common volume is 355 milliliters, which you might expect. However, sometimes more soda is poured and sometimes less is poured. Now also notice that it's more likely to have volumes close to 355 milliliters than it is to have volumes far from 355. You may also notice that this data looks a bit like a bell, and it's the bell shape that I want to discuss here. This bell shape often occurs in real life. For example, here's the distribution of the weights of babies born in Norway from 1992 to 1998. Here's the distribution of weights of males living in a certain country. And here are the results when we roll four dice 10,000 times in a row and record the sum of each roll. Now when histograms have this bell shape, you will find that the greater the population, the less jagged this bell becomes, until it becomes closer and closer to looking like this. We call this perfectly smooth distribution the normal distribution. And although most real-life populations don't have such a perfect distribution, many are close enough to be considered normal distributions. The great thing about normal distributions is that they all share some very specific characteristics. So whenever we're told that a certain population has a normal or near-normal distribution, then we already know a lot about that distribution. So let's check out the shared characteristics of all normal distributions by examining this particular histogram. Now I should mention that we could also use this ideal curve to discuss normal distributions, but I'd rather use this jagged one since it more closely aligns with the kinds of questions you'll see on test day. Okay, to begin, normal distributions are largely related to the mean of the population as well as the standard deviation of the population. The mean occurs right here in the middle. From here, we'll mark off the value equal to the mean plus one unit of standard deviation, the mean plus two units of standard deviation, and the mean plus three units. Now, if you're unfamiliar with units of standard deviation, you might want to go back and review our lesson on this topic. Okay, moving along, we'll also mark off the value equal to the mean minus one unit of standard deviation, the mean minus two units, and the mean minus three units. Now once we've done this, we can discuss the most important characteristic of all normal distributions. First, if we examine just the data that lies between the mean and the mean plus one unit of standard deviation, we'll find that approximately 34% of the data falls within this range. Also, since normal distributions are symmetrical about the mean, we know that about 34% of the data falls between the mean and the mean minus one unit of standard deviation. Also, for any normal distribution, about 13.5% of the data falls within this range, and likewise 13.5% over here. Finally, about 2.5% of the data falls within this range, and about 2.5% over here as well. In other words, for every single normal distribution, about 68% of the population is within one standard deviation of the mean, about 95% is within two standard deviations of the mean, and about 99% is within three standard deviations. Now this is very useful information to know about a population. So let's see how all of this looks in real life. Suppose we have a poultry farm where the weights of the chicken eggs are normally distributed. As soon as we know they're normally distributed, we know that the distribution of egg weights will look something like this. So at this point, all we need to do is plug in the information about the mean and the standard deviation of this population. Now we're told that the mean weight is 58 grams. So we know that 58 grams is situated right in the middle of this distribution. We're also told that the standard deviation of the egg weights is 5 grams. So let's add 5 grams to 58 to get 63 grams. This represents the mean plus one unit of standard deviation. Then we'll add five more grams to get the mean plus two units of standard deviation and five more to get the mean plus three units of standard deviation. We'll also subtract one unit of standard deviation, two units and three units. Finally, since this is a normal distribution, we know that the data must be distributed as follows. 
So for example, we know that about 34% of all eggs weigh between 53 and 58 grams. We know that about 47.5% of all eggs weigh between 58 and 68 grams, and so on. So by knowing that we have a normal distribution, and knowing the mean and standard deviation of the data, we're able to make a lot of conclusions about the population. Okay, now let's examine what happens if we have different means and different standard deviations. To do so, consider this scenario. We have two farms and once again the egg weights are normally distributed. So we already know quite a bit about their distributions. Let's say that 500 eggs are randomly sampled from each farm and their distributions look like this. So what conclusions can we draw about the eggs at the two farms? Well, first of all, we can see that at farm A, the mean egg weight is about 45 grams, and at farm B, the mean egg weight is about 65 grams. We can also make some conclusions about the relative standard deviations of the two populations. At farm A, the data is closely packed around the mean, whereas at farm B, the data is much more spread apart. So from this, we can conclude that farm B's standard deviation is greater than farm A's standard deviation. Now here comes the most important point in all of this. Since both of these distributions are normal distributions, we know that at both farms, about 68% of the eggs will be within one standard deviation of the mean, about 95% of the eggs will be within two standard deviations of the mean, and about 99% of the eggs will be within three standard deviations. The only differences are the actual means and the standard deviations at the two farms. Okay, that concludes this lesson. Let's examine everything you need to know about normal distributions on test day. First, the data values in a normal distribution are reasonably symmetrical about the mean. The mean, median, and mode of a normal distribution are all nearly equal. About 68% of the data are within one standard deviation of the mean. About 95% of the data are within two standard deviations. About 99% are within three standard deviations. And finally, the greater the standard deviation, the wider the bell curve.